It's great to be joined today by Elizabeth Currid Halkett, who's the James Irvine Chair in Urban and Regional Planning and Professor of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. She, mo she most recently is the author of The Sum of Small Things, A Theory of the Aspirational Class, which I recently read with great interest. Uh, Elizabeth, let's start a little bit with consumption and how in society over time, how consumption and wealth or status of other kinds is displayed. If we go back a few hundred years, generally speaking, how was wealth noticed uh, in, uh, in others? So if we go back to um, the person who was my inspiration for this book, uh, Thorstein Veblen, he wrote a book in 1899 called The Theory of the Leisure Class. And in it, he looked particularly at the leisure class, although he did make comments on all of society and how different socioeconomic groups revealed status. And his argument was that material goods that did not have additional utility um, were the ways in which people revealed wealth. So his very famous example is that of the silver spoon, which, you know, at the time, it wouldn't have been better than an aluminum one in terms of function. It wouldn't have even looked that much different, but there was it was slightly prettier. And what it really revealed was that you could afford a silver spoon. Mm. And so initially, status was a uh, was revealed through and displayed through um, stuff. Uh, and that has actually been the case for a long time, and it, and it still is. It's not like that way of showing status has been completely eradicated. But things have evolved because, you know, with first the Industrial Revolution and then the manufacturing economy of the 20th century, a lot of us have a lot of stuff. So it's, it's less valuable um, for social positioning. Uh, what about something like uh, at the time, and we'll get to how this has changed, but just to sort of set the scene, I want to dig into education a little bit. I mean, at the time, was education something that had uh, that that even had utility in the same way that it does today in the context of the job market? Or how was education seen at this time? So that's a, a really great question. Um, I'm really fascinated with the role of education in society and how it's evolved. So again, referring to Veblen, Veblen saw university educations as conspicuous leisure. Hmm. So you didn't go to, um, you know, Oxford and study Greek if you had to get a job, okay? It was incredibly luxurious to, to go to an elite institution just to learn. And empirically, um, you can see this because a lot of, you know, jobs, even in the 20th century when we had the emergence of a middle class where people were making really good money, um, you know, through jobs. It wasn't just simply like an, an upper class or an aristocracy, but you actually had this emergence of people who had, you know, real money um, and made and made it, e even they didn't require a college education. Now, the precise stats I don't have at the top of my head, but it was, it was under 10% for both men and women in the mid 20th century. Um, under 10% of them had a college degree. And now we're dealing with something like 33% of the population. So this gets back to your original question, which is how has education evolved as a signal in, in terms of signaling? So I think initially education was absolutely um, a part of conspicuous consumption, conspicuous leisure. You didn't need it. Um, you, you did it if you, 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 you were able to enroll in university, if you had the time, the money, and you didn't need to get a job. Today, it's different, right? So we live in a ostensibly, um, and I emphasize ostensibly, meritocratic society. And college is really important. And elite universities are really the ticket to the club. So whilst, of course, a parent's really proud when their kid gets into MIT or Harvard or one of these top elite universities, it's also a necessity for upward mobility to go to university. And so what I've seen in the data is I've actually moved education into inconspicuous consumption. People pay for it because they know it's their way to make it in the world now. And so it's not so much about status, even though that's a, a nice byproduct, but it is actually um, about how social mobility is reproduced and, and it's expensive now. 
and people really have to work to send their kids to college. And so that's become an enormous chunk of where certainly um, the upper middle classes are dev devoting resources. So in part two of the interview, we're going to get into some of the broader economic impacts on class and inequality of, of some of what you describe in the earlier part of the book, The Sum of Small Things. But I want to talk with you a little bit about um, some of the new inconspicuous consumption. And, and what's interesting to me about some of these activities, and this includes from, from the book, again, examples that you give free range organic chicken versus, you know, the normal chicken you get at the grocery store or heirloom tomatoes versus the other kinds of tomatoes or organic cotton shirt where, you know, the you know where the cotton was farmed and what the, the, the children of the farmers are studying in school or whatever the case may be. <laughs> yeah. You only really understand those as signifiers of status if you are, are already sort of part of the in group to at least some degree. Right. I mean, somebody who is not in the world where you even understand about organic cotton or heirloom tomatoes, they're not really going to be impressed when they find out that their neighbor has heirloom tomatoes or organic cotton shirts, right? Yep. Well, my parents would not be impressed with any of those things. Right. <laughs> so, you know, they my parents are Irish immigrants. Um, they they live in rural Pennsylvania. Um, and those would not be markers of status for them. And, um, you know, they're from a different generation, but I also think that they geographically speak to the fact that some of these kind of bubbles of aspirational class um, are geographically specific. And also they really are, it is sort of insider's baseball, you know, I mean, they're, they matter to the people who are following it, but, but they are, are more or less irrelevant to other people. And what does that tell us about, I, I guess, you know, we still have conspicuous consumption in 2017 and it's more along the lines of the car you drive, or if you have a particular type of watch or whatever the case may be, what are the sort of most notable distinguishing factors in how modern day conspicuous versus inconspicuous consumption is seen by society at large? So again, another really terrific question. So one of the things that's important is it's not like conspicuous consumption and conventional luxury goods have totally disappeared. I mean, mm. you know, People are still spending a lot of money on luxury cars. Designer handbags are still very popular. Um, you know, so so these you know, and, and of course watches are too. Um, so it's it's not it's not that they have disappeared. Um, and and the the identity in which people form around these things is also more fluid. So you know, there are all sorts of contradictions, right? Like you you care about org organic food and you um and you drive a diesel car, but you have a you know two thousand dollar handbag. Okay, I mean that that person exists in the world, right? So so I think that that you have this kind of blending. What makes I think the aspirational class unusual, and I think a new class of people is there is a a a new way in which they form their social group which is through these subtle um you know kind of you know tacit information that they the, the caring about organic food and free range this and caring about the environment um and in, and in a way you might say that they're not a million miles from what David Brooks called um, Bobos. Um, you know, I don't know if you remember the book Bobos in Paradise. Yeah. But the thing that I think is really different about this group um, is there's there's a real lack of self consciousness. Um, I mean, these are these are this is a group of people who feels they're doing right. Um, that they are making good decisions for their children, that they're making good decisions for the environment. Um, they are not having, they are not uncomfortable with their social position. They in fact think that unlike perhaps previous um, elites, um, that they're actually doing better in the world. They're not just buying luxury handbags. Um, they do prefer their NPR tote, you know? They're not all really wealthy. Um, what they what they are all rich in is cultural capital. And I think that that's the really distinguishing characteristic for them. We're going to pick it up there in part two of our interview with Elizabeth Currid Halkett. We've been speaking about her book, The Sum of Small Things, A Theory of the Aspirational Class. We're continuing our conversation now with Elizabeth Currid Halkett, who is the James Irvine Chair in Urban and Regional Planning and Professor of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. We've been speaking about her recent book, The Sum of Small Things, A Theory of the Aspirational Class. So, Elizabeth, yesterday we, we sort of explained the ways in which 
um, the the elites, the the new elites of, of sorts of 2017 can sometimes signal status. And it's increasingly through inconspicuous forms of consumption. And we talked about some of them in order to get us into the ways in which this is going to uh, impact inequality going forward. I want to talk a little bit about time and the availability of time, because as I read your book, that seems to be sort of an underlying theme in many of these uh, more inconspicuous, inconspicuous signals of status, like, for example, uh, breastfeeding for longer during motherhood, which is something that requires far more available time in order to do Pilates and yoga classes, particularly between nine and five Monday through Friday, uh, grocery shopping at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday, this sort of activity. So can you talk a little bit first about how we should see the value of this free time in modern society? So as and, and I, I think it was Thomas Frank um, uh, who or actually might have been Robert Frank, um, uh, uh, who 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 studied how much time people had. And he found that wealthier men and women actually had the least time of well, wealthiest wealthy women had the least time of all. And so what is interesting is as we've evolved into a knowledge economy, um, and all of these people with their, you know, pedigree and 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 elite degrees um, from top universities go into the workforce. They they aren't a leisure class at all. Okay, so today's elites, for the most part, are not. They are working really long hours. They're working sixty hours. If you're a lawyer, you're working on the weekends. If you're a doctor, you're doing on call shifts sometimes. Um, so you have a group of people who are making a lot of money, who are without question elites and yet they they the thing that they have traded off for that money and that prestige is time and so what happens is that that disposable income goes towards getting some of it back and so that's where you actually when you look at the patterns of upper income spending that you see people spending on things that give that back. They they spend money on housekeepers, on gardeners. They spend money on you know not nannies and it, you know at home childcare that allows them flexibility. Um, and and they 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 also spend money on experiences, um, which is you know using time in a way that that allows them to you know recharge and um, and 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 get the most out of it. Um, and then your 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 point about breastfeeding is really interesting because. Um, that of course requires a few different things, right? So it, it requires a lot of time. It requires um, it requires either having fantastic maternity leave and being usually paid for it, um, or and or it requires a, a partner who is making a lot of money so that you can stay home and breastfeed your child. Mm. And so all of these things are implicit signals of time. And your examples of Pilates and grocery shopping at um, you know, unusual hours of the day are also signals that you have it. And they are implicitly um, uh, revealing of social position. Because again, if you're an hourly worker, you're not going to be able to go grocery shopping at 11 in the morning. You're definitely not taking an ex exercise class at that time. If you're an hourly worker who doesn't get maternity leave, how do you figure out the breastfeeding thing? And and also, how do you how do you pump at work if that's not encouraged and that's not you're not in a company that really supports that? So, a, a lot of these signals really are about time and flexibility. When we look at the big picture of this move towards inconspicuous uh, uh, designators of status or wealth. Can we assess the multi generational impact on income and wealth inequality of that? Is that is there is there a clear sort of answer to that for you? If we compare, you know, how are how, how would someone's grandchild be impacted by the fact that they had silver instead of steel spoons versus how would they be impacted by increased spending on the types of activities you're talking about? So I so that that's a that's a really uh, great juxtaposition of how status goods in these two different centuries, two different time periods um, impact future generations. So, you know, leisure class spending um, didn't inherently um, impact social mobility. I mean, these may be people who have lots of wealth and they pass it on 
to generation after generation. Okay, so it's it, you know the, the kids with the silver spoons, um, you know, become adults with bigger silver spoons and children with silver spoons. But it's not the the actual um, display of status and the uh, and the mechanisms by which that's revealed don't reproduce the privilege. If that makes sense, the today it's very different. If you're able to put your kid into preschool early and you're able to put your children into either a fantastic public school district, which means you probably paid an awful lot of money for your house, particularly if you live in urban America, or you are able to put your child through private school, which these days, you know, runs 20 to 30 plus thousand dollars for kindergarten. Um, and these are our great schools, which then feed into great high schools, which then are really great, you know, preparatory schools for sending them to the most elite universities. Um, and then you're you're a parent who's able to write checks for those top schools and, and top universities, which now can be up to sixty thousand dollars a year after tax. Um, uh, you know, that that is a reproduction, that symbol of social economic position actually is a functional reproduction of privilege as well. So it's it's not the handbag or the spoon, which is simply like, here it is, look how rich I am. It actually has an ongoing functional um, component to it. You mentioned urban centers. I, I know you do an entire chapter on this, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the role of, of cities uh, within this aspirational class theory that you write about. So, Cities operate on two levels. So, um, first of all, you know, class identification often involves a group, right? So you can absolutely be, you know, eating your heirloom tomatoes and your free range chickens in a small town and no one knows. Um, and, and people do do that absolutely for sure. But part of this, of the identification of a class is the fact that there's a group of people doing this at the same time and who on some even if it's a tacit implicit level you're connecting with. So everyone's showing up at the farmer's market. They're not bragging about their organic peaches, but they're all there buying them, right? So you have this kind of group identification. Cities become centers of the aspirational class and its consumption. A few reasons for this. One is that cities have really evolved from being centers of um, production of things as they were in the um, you know, late 19th um, and middle 20th century to being production of ideas. Um, as a product of that, they've attracted these, you know, extremely um, educated, um, you know, Richard Florida calls them the creative class on um, this you know, group of people. And these people have a lot of money, so they need places to spend their money, right? So cities have also become centers of consumption. Um, the fact that so many of these um, you know, people who 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 work in knowledge industries tend to be a part of this aspirational class means that a lot of cities tend to cater to their needs. So you see tons of farmers markets and artisanal coffee and whole foods and, you know, you know, little boutiques with curated, um, you know, made in, you know, Los Angeles, for example, t-shirts, um, because these are the people who are going to spend them. So sp spend on them. So, so cities are, have, have become centers of consumption. And I would say in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, they become centers of this particular kind of spending too. We've been speaking about the book, The Sum of Small Things, A Theory of the Aspirational Class. The book's author has been joining me, Elizabeth Currid Halkett. I highly recommend the book, a very, very interesting read. And Elizabeth, I can't thank you enough for talking to us about it today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.